Hello, everybody. Uh, so the talk today, uh, this talk is on the model space. So essentially, this is a talk about how the JEDI system interacts with the forecast model that you're trying to do data assimilation for. So essentially, yeah, so there's this generic part of the JEDI system that we've been hearing all about. And then there's the forecast model that you actually want to do data assimilation with, which might be your atmospheric model or ocean model or whatever it is. And um, so there's a sort of an interface between the actual JEDI system and these forecast models. So one of the key things I think it's always important to remember is that it's really not necessary to have a very extensive understanding of the whole JEDI software in order to go ahead and customize it for the use with some specific model. And you really, <clears throat> the way the code is constructed means you just really need to have an understanding of the, the classes or interface classes, which describe the way that the JEDI system actually interacts with the model. And the way the algorithms work is, is not something that you need to necessarily understand to actually just use it. Um, so these interface classes that are associated with the actual forecast model, these are referred to um, in many cases as the, the model space. Um, so OOPS actually provides all these interface classes. It's sort of, it's not strictly necessary to have it work that way, but it, it's very convenient and it, it actually provides the user a, a, a nice place to go and actually look um, and see how JEDI needs to interact with the forecast model. You can basically infer quite a bit of understanding just looking at those classes and, and what they expect to be there. In addition, there's actually toy models included with OOPS and they provide examples for actually how to do these concrete implementations of the model space. So the objective of this talk really is just to kind of outline these classes, give a kind of list of what these classes are, and then sort of describe a little bit about each one and kind of how, how it works. So this slide here, which we don't expect you to understand, of course, um, the idea is just to highlight why we have these, these structures that we call the model space. So the all the math here just shows the, the cost function for a hybrid 4D bar system. Obviously, it looks quite complicated if you're not used to seeing something like that. But basically, just to outline that within this cost function, we see these kind of constructs that we represent within the software. So, for example, here in the blue boxes, we're looking at the increment. Um, so you can see the increment occurring in various different places. And so you can start to imagine the kinds of operations that might be required on, on the increment. And as, of course, if you write down the algorithm for minimizing this cost function, you're going to see all kinds of places where these increments crop up. You also see states where, you know, you just have like the actual model state. Um, so, you know, you might be computing the departure, which is this D term here. Um, and that really begins with the model, the model state kind of at the beginning of the window. And then it also might come up in like the localization where you have ensemble states. <clears throat> um, you also have variable changes. So this highlights linear variable changes where you have TLMs and adjoint versions of variable changes. They crop up in a lot of different places. You have the linear model in 4D bar. So that's a tangent linear and adjoint version of the actual forecast model. Um, you have error covariance model, the localization model. So these are the kinds of classes that interact. So most likely um, have seen this slide in some form um, throughout the academy here, um, but it's in it's sort of maybe worth showing it again in the context of this um, model space where it sort of really starts to take on quite a bit of meaning. So um, specific meaning. So at the top here, we have this application layer, which shows you the kinds of applications that might be available within the JEDI system. And then underneath here in the middle, we have um, these interface classes with the kind of pink color, I guess, uh, coral showing ones that are part of the model and then yellow showing ones that are part of the observations. So there's these two spaces, model space, observation space. 
And then underneath are actual implementations of these classes. So this middle layer, they exist in some sort of generic form that don't really do anything on their own, but then you can actually come along and implement them in some specific way. Um, so there's kind of two kinds of implementations of these classes. There's generic or reusable versions of the implementation, which exist, for example, in UFO and Yoda. And then in addition, Saver, which takes care of the background error in a generic way. Um, and then over here, there are certain classes that actually have to be implemented for each model. So you don't have to implement UFO for every model, um, but you do have to implement state and increment for every model. So you can see down the bottom left here, you might have versions of these classes that work for GFS or GEOS, uh, NASA's model, or MOM6, the ocean model, or the QG toy model. And so the nice thing is, is, you know, as you implement these classes, you achieve these applications, but you really don't need to know how to construct these applications. All you need to know how to do is construct these classes, you know, for the grid fields, et cetera, that that model has. So it's a very nice kind of separation of concerns and kind of limits the, as I said, you don't need to understand the whole system in order to actually make use of some of these applications. Um, so just, in, just a quick comment, I guess, about um, where you might, where you see these things coming up. So we've talked about this model space. So if you look in Oops code at all, as you're kind of learning about the system, you'll, you'll often see lines like this, where you have a template keyword and then this type name model. And so this model here basically is a, you consider it like a list or a collection of all of the interface classes that have been implemented for the specific model. So for GFS or POM6 or whatever. So here's a, a list of the classes that are actually included in this model space. So error covariance for doing the background error, the geometry, which is the grid of the model, of course, um, the geometry iterator, which is a thing that's needed for ensemble applications like LETKF, um, get values, which we'll talk about in a bit of detail here, but essentially it means interpolation from model space to observation space, um, as well as variable transforms, potentially. Um, the increment, the linear model, linear variable changes, localization, which uh, again is done by Sabre. Um, the, the model, which actually means the forecast model. So you sort of hear the word model meaning various different things. So there's the model space, which is the collection of all these classes. But one of the classes within the model space is model, which means the actual forecast model. So Jedi can actually drive that forecast model and make forecasts and interact with the model state as the model's propagating, which is a very key um, thing that, that Jedi can do. And then there's model auxiliary classes, which we won't really talk about today. Um, the state class, um, and then the nonlinear variable change. So these are all the classes that, you know, if you implement all these classes, you can basically inherit all of the applications available in Jedi. So one of the interesting things and things to keep in mind is that when you implement these classes, it leads to these applications incrementally. So you don't have to implement every class here. You only have to implement the ones for the applications you need. So here's just a, a subset of those applications and shown of these classes and shown in green are the ones that might have been implemented and gray, the ones that haven't been implemented. So if you're starting out from scratch with a new model, that hasn't been interfaced to Jedi before, you might start by doing the geometry, the get values and the state. And then actually once you've done that, you actually have an application, which is H of X. So you can simulate the observations basically at that point and make use of the entire UFO. If you then go ahead and implement error covariance, which is actually implemented for you in some sense through Sabre, and um, it's very simple to interact with Sabre. So if you implement that and also add the increment class, which doesn't differ too much from the state class in many ways, then you've implemented 3D VAR, 4D E and VAR. So at that point, you can actually do, without too much work, you're actually able to do 4D E and VAR, which is the, the um, type of data simulation that's done at NOAA in operations and uh, at NASA also. 
Um, then if you add localization, I guess technically you'd need localization to do what's in operations because it's hybrid. Um, but again, localization is actually taken care of for you by, by Sabre. And if you add the model, the forecast model itself, which um, means you can actually drive the forecast and interact with the model state as the model's running, then you can do kind of more interesting things, maybe like run 40 H of X's in core. Um, you can, so you could run a forecast and be simulating H of X as the forecast runs. You can do um, FGAT type things in core um, and you can do um, running the actual, just a forecast itself. And then if you add the linear model, then you can do um, 40 bar. Now, of course, you know, you have to develop the linear model, which might not be straightforward, but once you have that and implement it, you can uh, do the 40 bar application. So this just gives a kind of an overview of what these classes look like. So if you kind of look at the OOPS interface classes, um, this is the kind of structure that you would see. So this one shows the geometry actually. Um, and so you can see this template coming in again, where we have model, which is our sort of telling it that we're going to kind of overload this with <clears throat> the specific model that we've implemented. Maybe that's GFS. And then you'll see various other things. So, um, you know, first of all, this, this, um, these traits come in and then they, they create these kind of concrete versions of these, um, this class. And then over here, you see basically the definition of the interfaces. So these kind of aren't changeable. Like if you're implementing geometry, you're not gonna, you can't change the interface. You wouldn't want to anyway. Um, so you can see like here, you're, you have a constructor for the geometry or two different kinds of constructors and, and a destructor. And it tells the system, you know, what you need to pass to the constructor, in this case, configuration and the communicator. And then you have sort of accessor functions. So you might um, return the communicator that was used to initialize the geometry, for example. Um, there's some interaction with Atlas, which we won't get into today. And then finally, you'll see that there's basically a pointer down at the bottom, and that's um, pointing to the actual kind of object that's created. So the one that's like the concrete implementation of that for that model. Um, yeah, so then you have these methods. So this is the, you know, we, we saw here the, the constructor. So this is what that method looks like in the generic part of the system. So you can see the, um, the constructor receives the config that's listed as parameters here and the communicator. Um, and then essentially, you know, what, what you see, um, you see a bunch of kind of calls here, but then the key step here is where you actually call the, the actual concrete constructor. So you remember the geom underscore is the pointer to the actual um, object. And then you basically kind of create a new version of that object here passing in the configuration and the communicator. And you'll see, you know, as we um, go along here, we have these other calls here. So we have uh, logging that happens, basically just saying that we're beginning and ending this method. So we can use that for debugging. Um, you'll also see timers, um, and that just measures the time that this call takes basically, and then it goes out of scope um, at the end of that call. So the nice thing is there is that you know the user is going to implement this this um, what what happens when this call is made they're going to implement that method but all of this trace um, the logging and timing they don't need to be replicated in every single version of this class for all the different models it's taken care of sort of at the oops level so it's quite convenient to have these kind of interface classes and construct the code in that way it makes it nice and easy for people coming in and adding new code new models and uh, helps to eliminate too much duplication so you can see <clears throat> from the, the geometry constructors here so as i said it's just a sort of graphical representation now of how these classes behave so we have a configuration and a communicator that come in and then you can create your this geometry object you can also create one from um, an existing geometry. So you see this second call here where geometry is the argument and it's the thing that's created as well. So you can kind of, it's basically just like copying a geometry. 
In terms of the states, we'll do just graphical representations of this to keep the, the talk not too heavy with code. So I've listed the four state kinds of state constructors here. So there's one you know, that has a geometry, variables, and a date time. So basically it's creating kind of an empty state with certain variables, certain fields. One that has geometry and configuration. So again, it's like going to be an empty state, um, but because you've been given it initially, but because you've given it this configuration, you can actually use that to, you know, create that state by reading things from disk because now you can give it file names through the configuration. Um, so it becomes sort of obvious what you're supposed to do with these constructors based on what these arguments are. So if you're given a configuration, it's kind of implied that you need to kind of use that to initialize the state. Um, you can also provide um, sort of like a copy constructor, but with a geometry additionally as an argument. So this means that you could sort of copy and change resolution as you're creating that new state. And then there is just a straight copy constructor as well. There's a bunch of methods for the state class. So this just lists a few of them. So um, there's things like checking the time on the, the state, changing the time on the state, reading and writing. So remember, you get that config, you can actually do some reading and writing from disk. Um, you can um, access the, the geometry and the variables from the state. You can uh, there's a norm, so you can compute the norm of the state. You can make it all set to zero. You can do accumulation. So you're basically doing like one state plus a constant times another one. Um, and then there's this, you know, serialized functions, which are really just for certain ensemble things where you need to um, work with sort of multiple ensembles in one executable. Get values is a very key thing that is the model interface developer is responsible for putting together. Um, so the idea here is that what uh, JEDI does is it basically introduces these very sort of strict standardized interfaces between the model and the observation worlds um, so that it makes it very simple to kind of communicate information back and forth, most importantly, but also equally importantly, probably um, is to make sure that there's no dependency between the model and the observation operators. So the, the observation operators can't depend on the model. And similarly, the model can't depend on the observation operators. And that lets those two things be kind of developed independently. So in this schematic here, you'll see that we have the observation operator over here on the right-hand side, which is owned by UFO. And that's interacting with various things. And then on the right, the left-hand side here, we have get values. And so get values kind of happens in two stages. There's a constructor, which basically puts together interpolation weights. Um, so it's done sort of once because it's quite an expensive calculation potentially. And then there's a second part called fill geovals, which actually kind of puts, gets everything ready for the observation operator. So the observation operator can tell the model the locations. So the model has a grid, maybe it's cube sphere or lat long, whatever it might be. And then the observations are on individual lat long points. And so that with that information, using the geometry, we can actually construct the interpolation weights. Then later on, when we're ready to actually call the observation operator, the observation operator will communicate, first of all, the variables that it needs. So if it's, say, you know, CRTM, radiance calculation, it's, it's going to need pressure and um, temperature and maybe some information about the surface. We already know the locations. So now that we have the variables, um, which is communicated via the GeoVals object to the model, we basically now can do a variable transform. So we can say, OK, I need temperature, but I have potential temperature. The model, has, the model state has potential temperature. So I'm going to convert it to, to um, from potential temperature to temperature and then use my interpolation object that I've created to actually interpolate to the observation location. So now I have temperature observation locations, which is called a geoval, which is a geophysical value observation locations. And then that can be passed back to the observation operator. So from the model's perspective, it's very generic. It's just a list of fields, a list of names of fields, and a bunch of locations that it needs those fields at. And then my work is to create those fields 
at those locations. And that's all that I need to do from the model perspective. And then the observation operator will do what it needs to do with that, with that data. So in terms of what it looks like, um, you basically have for the constructor, the geometry and the location. So you have your grid and the lat lons of the observations, and then you can do your construction. Then when you actually come to the method part, um, you have the state coming in. So that's your state with potential temperature, say, and then the date time that that state's valid for, because you're working with a whole window. So these locations up here for the whole window, then you've got two date times that represent the valid time for that state. Um, so it might be like the beginning and ending time step of the model, for example. And so then you're going to basically fill up those that part of the, um, the G evals. So the thing that kind of comes back out is the, is the G evals. So if it's 3D situation, these date times would just be the beginning and end of the window. If you're doing stuff in 4D, they would be the sort of sub windows. And the increment class um, is a bit like the state class. There's a few extra methods that are needed. Uh, the constructor, again, you can have one that's, you have one that's the geometry variables and date times. It's just uh, an empty increment essentially with some variables. You can have one which is the geometry and increments. That's the copy constructor with interpolation. Um, and then there's the um, straight up copy constructor. So note that there's no config constructor for increment because you'd never need to read an increment from disk. You can only create increments from states. Differences in states. So for example, here you can use the diff function to diff two states to make an increment. Other methods in this increment class would be ones, so setting everything to one, doing a Dirac, which is where you set it to one, it's just one location. There's a, um, some various operators, and there's um, functions like dot product and sure products, um, randomizing the increment, and then interaction with Atlas for use using increments with Saber. There's also a linear version of get values I should have, should have probably mention earlier. Um, it's very, very similar basically, but now there's an adjoint version of it included. So in many cases, the, the, the non-linear one is really linear. Um, so they're very similar. The only difference is the need for an adjoint version. It's, it wouldn't be self-adjoint. So um, you need to implement an adjoint version of the method. So the model class, which is the interaction with the actual forecast model. So this shows the, the class. So you have a constructor with the configurations. Then you have a method called forecast, which basically runs the forecast. And then um, some kind of like accessor functions. And you'll see that privately you have three internal functions, initialize, step, and finalize. So a forecast, which is the only thing that's sort of public to the, in this class, will internally call these initialize step finalize. So initialize means initialize the model before you start running it, stepping it, you know, stepping it one time step and then finalizing when you're, when you're done. And um, so this is kind of like what a forecast looks like within the algorithm. So you have a constructor, um, then you have an initialize. And then after initialize, you might call post processors. So that could be, you know, H, calling H of X or saving the trajectory for um, the linear model. Then you basically go into a loop where you start stepping the model. And after each step, you call those post processors as well. And then eventually when the model is done, um, you would call finalize and then the post processor. And then note that you can actually run multiple forecasts within the same executable. And so this can then go into another loop where you might you can call that initialize and finalize again. But the nice thing is, is you don't construct the model more than once. So you don't sort of create and allocate all the memory for the model every time you need to run a forecast. You just do that once and then you can go into these loops. So in the, in the, for, um, the forecast method within that class, and um, you have a state that comes in. There's an auxiliary, which could be like um, correcting for bias in the model, and then a duration 
which is the length that you need to run, and then the post processor. So you initialize, um, you call the post processor on the initialize, the initialize of the post processor, and you actually call the post processor with the initial state of the model. Then you do your time stepping each time you call your post processor, and then you finalize at the end, and then you just check that you went forward enough time. Um, and that's it, basically. Yeah. So you have these kind of private methods that get called by this forecast. From in terms of the graphical representation of these, so for the constructor, you have a geometry and a configuration that come in, so you can create the model. So you've actually already created the geometry for the model ahead of time because you need it elsewhere as well. So you save having to do it multiple times, and the configuration will just tell you sort of how you want to run the model. And then for the step part, for example, you'd have a state and the auxiliary coming in and then a new state coming out at the new time. The linear model is basically the same thing, except there's a forecast TL and a forecast AD, where you call your tangent linear and adjoint versions of the model. Um, again, they're public, whilst the, um, the actual functions that you implement are private or protected. There's an additional function called set trajectory, which is called as the nonlinear model's running, and that actually um, a, the state the state comes in, which is from the model, and then um, you have your saved trajectory state coming out. Variable changes, that's a very key element of doing um, any kind of data simulation, really. Um, so the constructors for variable changes is the geometry and the configuration, typically. Um, so you might need to sort of tell it how to behave. And you might need a geometry in case you're going to sort of allocate some memory to save some variables. And then you have a change var and change var inverse function. So a state comes in and a state comes out. So, and then there's an inverse, which basically could do the inverse. So if you start with a particular state, call the change var, you get to your new state, and then you can call the inverse to get back to your original state. <clears throat> One caveat is that we are considering changing a bit how this works and removing the the inverse version and just having a list of variables actually control the way these work instead, which might make this a little bit cleaner. Again, there's a linear version of it with the, the same caveat that this might um, be changed in the next few months. It's very similar. The, the difference is the constructor receives the state so that you can save the trajectory in case you need to linearize you know, about the trajectory. And then they're called multiply instead of change var because you're sort of multiplying an increment by a, a matrix in this case. And then there, there's multiply, multiply inverse, and then adjoint versions of those as well. So in terms of, uh, you know, just to leave you with a, a list here of all the models that are being interfaced JEDI at the moment. So um, there's the UFS or the at least the atmospheric component of, of UFS. So I guess UFS kind of encapsulates encapsulates the whole kind of coupled model, but there's the atmospheric part of UFS, which is GFS, um, using the FE3 JEDI interface to the JEDI system. That's a NOAA model. Similarly, we have GEOS, which is a FE3 based model too. There's chemistry versions of both um, GFS and GEOS. There's regional versions of, of GFS for both meteorology and air quality. And all these are using the FE3 JEDI interface. MPAS is being MPAS atmosphere is being in, interfaced uh, to Jedi. Wharf, um, I think that might be paused now that work, but we have a Wharf interface. Elfric and the UM, the two Met Office models for the atmosphere, are being implemented. And within this sort of SOCA interface, we're implementing um, MOM6, SIS2, and SI6, which are ocean and sea ice models. Um, so those are actually kind of coupled within the SOCA interface. Then there's the Neptune model from NRL, um, and then there's um, several toy models as well. And this list is probably not up to date, actually. I think there are even more ocean models. I think the ROMS ocean models being added at the moment. And I think there's actually a couple others that might be being added as well. So anyway, you can see that there's a fairly comprehensive list of models being added to Jedi now. So there's lots of examples to follow if you are pursuing this work yourself.